define that. What, what does blockchain offer as a future? Is it going to make an impact in prop tech in 2021 in the next five years, or, or is this more of a decade long um, time frame for blockchain? Or do you disagree? Do you think blockchain will never make an impact in real estate as the guy that started off with that vision? Yeah, uh, I personally think it's a matter of uh, decade or a decade five plus. to ten years. Uh, yeah, I don't know if decade. So it's not zero to five, it's five to ten. Yeah, five, five, not, not one to five, but five to ten years, in, in my opinion. I think that there's still a um, couple of things need to, to happen. Um, I do, have, again, a big believer on blockchain, both in the fintech and the prop tech industry. I think that the concept of uh, decentralization um, is, is, is exactly, you know, uh, suitable for this type of, uh, you know, fragmented ownership um, and dealing with other, you know, different kind of parties where you need to find a mean of trust. Uh, so I definitely see blockchain as a big enabler for a few of these, um, um, you know, uh, like issues. And, but I also think it's going to take a bit time. I think that the first thing is companies like us that are just digitizing, not uh, tokenizing, but digitizing the space. I think this is the first, the first phase, taking these Excel, taking these workflows, taking this uh, fragmented data and putting everything in, you know, centralized one place, one repository, one system of record. And afterwards, I think this is the next step um, using this blockchain technology in order to really create another mean of trust and decentralization. I see. Yeah, that, that, I like that. That's something to take away here, which is digitization before tokenization. Yeah. Now, if it's five to 10 years out, does that mean it's too early for anyone trying to build a company in the blockchain ecosystem? Or is it the right time because you need to take a 10-year view? Or do you think it's better to start a blockchain company later on in the industry once more of the infrastructure is in place? Or, or do you think now is a good time? Personally, I think that if you are building an infrastructure, um, this is this is the time. But if you are trying to build something which is less tech infrastructure but more business oriented, and um, I think uh, now it's not the best time. And I think um, and this is something that will have to to happen in in a couple of years from now. Fantastic. All right. I I think I agree with that. I haven't yet, and this might change by the time someone listens to this. Uh, podcast. I haven't yet made an investment in a blockchain-focused prop tech startup, but I have looked at it. I've come close, but for the same reasons you mentioned, um, I just think it's a bit too early, and the infrastructure itself is something that's interesting. But how that relates directly to prop tech is harder to correlate. You know. Um, so, Mar, do you do you have any questions for me? Anything you'd like to ask me? Um, either as a you know former entrepreneur, or real estate investor today, or a venture capitalist. Sure, um, I would love to know you know how you see the next you know couple of years, um, as an entrepreneur that both deal with real estate and prop tech specifically. And what are the specific uh, let's say areas that you are trying to focus within the prop tech space? Is it more you know a uh, transactional based? Um, infrastructure based construction tech and so you know what, what are the things that you uh, see for the next let's say one two three or five uh, five years yeah so when i make investments i try to take a very long-term view um i try to you know when you're making an investment into startups you need to be thinking in in you know a five to ten year time span rather than a one to five year as you said so how, how big can a company be and most VCs are focused on risk mitigation rather than uh, reward maximization. Uh, and I understand why, and I can appreciate that. But if you want to get those 100x, 1,000x returns, that's going to come usually with a higher risk profile where you can lose 100%. Too many people are playing this like they're trading options on the stock markets, where you know, your downside, you're trying to limit, but then your upside is also capped as a function of that, right? Uh, I, I look. I thought about starting a prop tech company myself, and then decided to be a VC because I analyzed the space, and there were so many different areas you could start a company in. And each one of these areas, maybe twenty different areas, could turn could, could result in numerous unicorns. When you when you face that type of dynamic, I felt the best way to play that is to invest in startups in the space 
than to try to focus on one area only. Because this whole prop tech ecosystem and fintech broadly is, 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 you know, 10 years from now, it's going to be very different. And the fundamentals behind it, the scale of the asset class is tremendous. So as you, as you push me on specific verticals within PropTech, um, you've got to think about what the world looks like, especially as right now we're coming out of the pandemic and all of us have, have uh, got bias, whether we like to believe it or not. We have all been traumatized. We have all been affected by this experience that hopefully we never have to see again as humanity. And we're prioritizing and we're looking at certain assets. We know that hotels have been destroyed. We know retail has been absolutely hammered. We know that other areas like multifamily and industrial within real estate have done really, really well in a good, you know, growth areas. So it's, it's tempting to focus on investments in those areas, but I think there's going to be a rebound in some categories. So I think coming out of COVID, some things that are going to be around more, I think people are going to slowly return back. We're going to be more conscious about um, contact. The more you can have contactless technology to improve the experience of the end user, whether it's a tenant, whether it's a visitor at a hotel, those technologies are going to be key. And I think the operators of, of these assets realize by implementing contactless solutions, you don't need that many people. You, you really don't need to have this high touch experience unless you're going for a high end approach. So as you start to implement access control, which inevitably means you, you, know, you can just walk through a building and it opens up for you, right? Whether it's facial recognition, which I've, I've invested in, or whether it's some other type using your phone, um, easy access and then going to hotels, for example, and checking in very easily um, is key. Ordering things too. Lots of people have been forced to order uh, order through food delivery apps, you know, and, and do the food shopping through Instacart rather than in person. And I think those habits are sticky. And you wonder, why do I want to go and queue up and go to the grocery store and try to navigate the aisle uh, from the comfort of my home? Within a few clicks, I can have something delivered here. So on demand will be quite key as well. And with that comes a lot of last mile delivery opportunity, a lot of startups tackling the space of logistics and warehouses. Um, you know, the, uh, I'm, I'm a GP at a private equity real estate fund, Bluefield, where we, we, we have a lot of industrial warehouses and our timing couldn't have been better there. Another thing coming out of COVID, I think, is sustainability in the environment. So we are now more conscious of um, the sustainability aspects. The world has made promises, the real estate industry has made promises about meeting carbon neutrality standards, reducing emissions, uh, reducing waste, and the feet, again, the feet's gonna be hot to the fire here where tenants are expecting buildings to be much more green in how they run. So if you believe that trend, smart buildings, energy management is another key area of interest. Um, we've been looking at that space quite a bit. The indoor environment, so that could be air purification, air filtration, um, even more amenities that promotes um, well-being. So amenities that you know might allow you to have like a napping inside of an office or enjoying the experience of an office or a home more as the office and home blend together. Um, it's a big ask to ask people to go back to the office, right? If you're in the comfort of your home and you're going to go back to the office and you're going to commute and you're going to go there, you're not going to want to be behind a cubicle, right? So when I talk about the amenities and the experiences for the end user, um, that's what I'm referring to here. I, I, I really do believe that if you've been working from home, you've been blessed by the fact that you haven't had to endure the commute, you can spend time with family and your loved ones and your you know, for some people that have left larger urban cities are now in more rural areas where there's more land and you're back to nature. How on earth are you going to convince this group of people? <laughs> and this group, by the way, is, is a large group, right? It's, it's everyone right now, as we come out of a pandemic, is working remote. How are you going to convince these people to return back to the office, right? It, you have to rethink that whole experience. Um, then there's areas that you're targeting, for example, right, where the information asymmetry exists. 
So that's in how you find real estate deals and how you evaluate real estate deals. These two things are big, right? Uh, a lot of investors pride themselves on their ability to have unique deal flow, get access to off-market deals. There's going to be a whole plethora of, of software that's going to help identify off-market deals using AI, using some smart contact-like tracing technology, probably powered behind a GIS system, which is sort of a map interface. I've seen a lot of companies that are doing this for different verticals, maybe for land, maybe trying to find you know, hotels that can be repurposed into multifamily, technology that can help you identify new deals. And then after that, technology that can help you underwrite the deals. How do you truly analyze? How do you get all the data from the underlying real estate asset and analyze that data? How, how do you make sure the numbers you're being given are uh, not audited, but are accurate? Often it's a sham. You buy a building and, and you know the numbers might be fake. And unfortunately, this happens too often. It's a joke to be saying this as we're into 2021, uh, that these problems still exist today and they shouldn't. So technology that solves that will be key. And then also where you said, helping those dollars flow more. So, you know, as, as you've said, the real estate asset class should be easy to transact in like stocks are, okay? And, and I, wanna, I wanna challenge you on this in a minute. There are different asset classes and they have different challenges, but absolutely, if you're gonna have so much of your wealth in 401ks and you're gonna have so much of your wealth in residential real estate, well, hold on, maybe you want some of that wealth diversified in commercial real estate. Maybe you want to open up that. And, and that's a function of the price to access the real estate. Usually you can't access these deals because the minimums are so high and you need to know a fund manager. So I do think the whole real estate landscape to invest and start uh, invest in, in real estate projects will change. Like the Robin Hood for real estate approach where there'll be mobile yeah. apps, you know. So that's interesting.